Welcome to Stick at Night. I'm your County Commissioner, Anthony L. Romano, representing the great cities of Jersey City and Hoboken and District 5 and all the wonderful other cities in our county. With me today, I have someone, one of the smartest uh, gentlemen I ever went to high school with, and also a sense of humor, a dedicated person who rose to great heights in the, his profession, but never forgot where he came from. He's a Jersey City son, born and raised before he went on to his fame. And I'm not talking about Joe Lane yet, I'm talking about Joe Murray. Welcome aboard, Joe. Thank you, Tony. I'm very pleased to be with you. Joe Lane, okay. Joe Lane was one year ahead of us at yes. St. Peter's no, Prep. one year you? behind us. Yeah, I'm sorry, we were us. one year ahead of him, correct. Yes. correct. All right, Joe, give us some background on you. Tell us, you know, Jersey City, born and raised, where you happened to give us a little. <sighs> that, that could take the whole show, so I'm gonna keep it very brief. Jersey City, born and raised, went to prep with you. Um, went on to college, university, New York University, et cetera, then joined AT&T, went overseas for an aggregate period of about 30 years, almost 28 years. Wow. So I lived outside of the, yeah, the most of my adult life was spent outside of the U.S. But as you kindly mentioned, I've never lost touch with my Jersey City roots. Uh, the closest guys in my emotional inner circle were the guys that I grew up with in Jersey City. And uh, as you know, we you stayed. I didn't realize you were gone 28 years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. What's your title yeah. in your profession now? Well, I don't want to say I'm retired, but let's say I'm an ex-corporate executive. And I'm now a self-promoting entrepreneur in the media production world. And where are you living now, Joe? Uh, I am living in just north of Dallas, Texas. So it's kind of hard to describe me as a, liberal, <laughs> as a liberal Democrat because Texas doesn't really identify with that, with that label. Uh, probably a political independent with, with more of an interest in the political past than our political present at the moment. Good. Well, tell us about your book, Start Off. That's not really a book. Uh, I did publish some stuff through the New Jersey Historical Society back in the mid-'80s, and that, I've kept that research alive with some intermissions, of course, uh, digressions into into my overseas adventures but really Tony a lot of this stuff is a journey of self-discovery because I come from a political family that I was not that aware of growing up because my dad died yeah my dad died very young when I, he was young and I was even younger <laughs> I was nine so a lot of this stuff was was driven by two things a desire to sort of better understand my heritage in that regard and because we were sitting on a treasure trove of historical documentation, films, photographs, and such that I didn't really come to appreciate until much later in life. Um, and then once I started digging in that stuff, a lot of which is now with the New Jersey Historical Society, it, it just is was Jersey an eye Is Jersey City aware of this? Is the Jersey City Museum aware of this? Yes, so I'm very in touch with um, the Jersey City Public Library, the New Jersey Room. They were involved in three, in all three of the documentaries that we produced with increasing involvement as we went from one to the next. I got a little bit better at it, a little more proficient. Yes, very good. Storytelling very good. and so forth. Thank you. Uh, the last one probably being the best, but the last one is more contemporary because it touches on my father's political career, which was an interesting transition period from, from 57 to 61, kind of um, pivoting Jersey City onto the trajectory that it's that it's now enjoying with its renaissance and its rebirth. That would be the Hague to Whalen, I mean, to, um, to uh, Kenny. Kenny, Kenny, yeah, correct. So it was sort of the, uh, the heyday of the Kenny period, which ended around 71. And then you had a whole series of guys with Paul Jordan and such that were putting us on to, uh, into more of a, a reformist kind you of a laugh? direction. I'm on the, I just got the honor of being elected to the 200 Club, which is a police uh, fire group that we give scholarships out to the children of uh, first responders as well as uh, awards good. to those who are valor and guess who's on the committee it gives me a history of of uh, paul jordan father paul jordan schiller. himself no oh, father, father schiller, schiller of course father schiller of course father schiller from st peter's yep so go ahead joe so well no, that's it i mean basically in a nutshell that's where we are uh, i appreciate you having the interest in what I've been up to. Of course, this is all a sideline thing. Yeah, tell us about your but, dad. But, um, well, we really wanted to talk about Haig, and I guess it's, Go ahead. it's sure. impossible to talk about the Murray family politically without discussing Frank Haig, because they were always on the opposite side. Uh, 
Really? However, interestingly enough, when you go farther back to my great grandfather's generation, my great grandfather, Thomas Murray, was a Republican and he was a supporter of then the last Republican mayor of that period, Mark Fagan, who was a great reformer, kind of in the Roosevelt progressive reformist tradition for the Republican Party. His brother, however, was a staunch Hague supporter from the very beginning. Interesting, right? Political families and, and the dynamics of divided loyalties. So his name was George Murray, and he became an indispensable ally of Haig. He was the fifth ward leader for Haig up until 1930. And he was there with Haig during probably Haig's most, the apex of Haig's political career. And he served as his superintendent, superintendent of municipal relief, otherwise known as a poor master. Now, if you know anything about machine politics, you know how important the poor were to Haig's political machine. The majority of his constituents. Something, something Joe would yeah, they were all, with regard to Hoboken about the poor mass. That's right. Killing. I saw that. I haven't read it, but I did see the title. Um, <laughs> but the poor master was a very important position. Anyway, the crux of it is that there were different loyalties in my family, including supporting Haig very, very um, vociferously, which is what my great grand uncle did. His nephew, my grandfather, on the other hand, uh, wound up being the first serious Democratic challenger to Frank Haig in 1929. Wow. But yeah, so he ran what was called, he ran on what was called a fusion ticket because we had the commission system at that time. And they almost beat Haig. Now, 1929 was, was a turning point for Haig because he pissed off everybody that originally supported him especially the Jersey Journal. Like so the that. Jersey Journal, um, he was in bed with the Jersey Journal in the beginning because Haig launched himself as many of Jersey City's politicians did as reformers. And he launched himself as a reformer championing a change of government, which at that time was going to the city commission form of government under the Walsh Act. So it was adopted in 1913. Haig became one of the first commissioners to serve under commission government. And then from 1913 on, he was just like a Polaris missile. He just never stopped rising. He just never stopped seeking to get to the top. Um, but by the mid to late 20s, he was becoming so arrogant that he alienated a lot of his earlier supporters. The Jersey Journal was owned by Republicans, believe it or not, a dear family at that time. And then they just turned against Haig, and the paper Joe, became a very... We'll break for a commercial, and then we'll come right back. I'm your commissioner, Anthony Romano. Be right back. We have to be able to police ourselves because we don't want anybody to tarnish our badge. When internal affairs complaints are not handled properly, the public may believe that most officers commit crimes, when in fact that's not true. Most officers are professional. Most officers do not commit crimes. Um, if, the com if complaints aren't taken properly and the community that we serve doesn't have a trust in the police department, I mean, th th there has to be legitimacy. Um, if, if the community doesn't trust the police, how could we effectively serve them? And by having a really comprehensive internal affairs unit that handles the complaints properly and people have trust in, in the system, it enables us to do our entire job as a police department much better. We need the community as much as they need us. So that citizen that has lost trust in the community could be a very important witness for us tomorrow. Hudson TMA reminds you that before you ride, you should perform the ABC Quick Check. Here's how to do it. You don't want your bike to fail you. So get in the habit of doing the ABC Quick Check before you ride. A is for air. Check that your tires are properly inflated. They should be pumped up to the inflation rating printed on the tire. Many bicycle pumps come with a pressure gauge, so you can make sure they're properly inflated. Low pressure tires can easily puncture. B is for brakes. Check that your brakes are working. Your brake lever shouldn't come closer than a thumb's width to the handlebar. Your wheel should spin freely when the brakes are off. C is for the cranks, chain, and cassette. Grab both crank arms like this and wiggle them to make sure they aren't loose. Spin the pedals and make sure the chain runs smoothly through the gears. Quick 
means making sure your wheels are on tight if you have quick release wheels. The wheels should be snug in the dropouts and the quick release lever fastened tight. I've been elected to office for over 25 years at the head of the government of your city. The last time I was elected was only but a few months ago, and it was very near unanimously. And when you realize, my friends, that thousands, practically 90% of the inhabitants of Jersey City are working people, that shows you that my record speaks for itself. In his political heyday, Haig ruled his city so absolutely that it was a matter of indisputable fact rather than boasting when he declared, I am the law. He was a force in national politics too, for at Democratic conventions, his iron control of the New Jersey vote made him a decisive figure in many close contests. Welcome back to Stick at Night. I'm your commissioner, Anthony Romano, with my dear friend Joe Murray, an amazing clip you just sewed. That is amazing. It was so clear. Thank you for that, Joe. Oh, you're most welcome. That's actually Joe, an excerpt you from... You, uh, I just go, want to, what you call it, just work with you on one thing. Hoboken was tied. They were almost like uh, baby, uh, bro baby sisters to each other because Haig and McFeely, their rise, Feely. their rise and their fall and their success were all linked to each other. And he succeeded a Fagan too as mayor. That Fagan Iron Works, that's somehow a relative. I don't know if it was a brother or a cousin. I'd have to look that up. Is that so? But if you look at all really? the old plates which have been removed in Hoboken, it all had Fagan Iron Works. So the connection to Hoboken and Jersey City is just fantastic. The same thing with the control of the police services, the Hudson County um, police at that time. So go ahead, I'm sorry. Right. No, not at all. But just a word on that clip. Uh, so that's the only known report, recording that we have of Frank Haig's voice. And it was a real, <laughs> it was real skullduggery to try and get it because um, we knew it existed because he did that speech 30 minute long speech in 1938 in the in Jersey City Armory, uh, which was part of his anti Reds campaign. He was kind of like the uh, precursor to Joseph McCarthy. He had this phobia about communism. So, uh, anyway, that, that took quite a bit of doing to get. We actually had to go to the uh, Library of Congress, which owns the WOR archives, to get to dig that out and actually wow. reproduce it and make it available. So the whole speech in its entirely in its entirety is available at the library in Jersey City. So uh, where did we leave off? We were talking about your grandfather and how his connection is the fifth ward leader. That was my great grand uncle. His nephew, my grandfather, uh, was an independent businessman. He was president of the Jersey City Businessmen's Association. He was kind of induced to run on this fusion ticket that was designed to topple Haig. It was Republican. It was primarily dominated by Republicans, but you had two Republicans and two Democrats. My grandfather was an independent Democrat, and he decided to join in the anti-Haig crusade. And they almost beat Haig in 1929. But of course, there was a lot of, um, there was a recount, and there were a lot of irregularities, which no one should be surprised in how the voting was carried out. But in the end, Haig survived. And then from that point, went on to uh, almost an impenetrable political dominance in New Jersey right up until 1949. Uh, but my grandfather came back, my grandfather came back and tied up with Kenny in 49 and then finally took him down 20 years later. So that's, that's kind of the, the gist of how my family was involved with, with Haig directly, always on the opposite side. What, what, what's, your, what's your objective view of the Hague era? Fascinating. Very difficult question to answer, and it's, it's gone under a lot of reappraisal. Of course, he was depicted as like the archetype evil boss, corrupt, venial, uh, venality was everywhere in his regime, all of which is partially true, but he's a very complex figure, and there are a lot of redeeming qualities about him and about the period of time that he ran the state, which he did as part of the minority party. 
So Haig was able to run New Jersey basically because of the densely populated counties to the north that were Democratic. But the state, by and large, was largely Republican, which is why the le legislature was mostly Republican. But Haig always ensured that the governors were either Democrat governors of his choosing or Republicans that he could live with. Now, if you want, we can actually take a look at what I call Haig's greatest political hits, which is among the slides that you have keyed up. Sure. And it, it just because we talk about stolen stolen elections today, right? On the national level. Well, Haig kind of wrote the book on stealing elections. Without a doubt. And <laughs> he, had, he had and, police officers going to cemeteries, writing down names of those that were dead to vote. Absolutely. And that practice continued well on beyond Haig into Kenny and so forth. But Haig formed an interesting, a very curious relationship with a guy in Atlantic City named Nucky Johnson. Now, if you're familiar with the TV show Boardwalk Empire, he was a Republican boss who ran Atlantic County in the southern part of the state. Haig in 1916 was only a city commissioner, but he was already consolidating and expanding his political power so that he was becoming a force at the state level, even before he became mayor in 1917. And he cooked up a deal with Nucky Johnson that served their mutual interests by displacing a Republican that Johnson didn't want to win named Austin Colgate related to the Colgate family, Jersey City Colgate works, right? And Haig wanted to dump his former mentor, a guy named Otto Whitpen. So the two of them colluded to get a Republican to be nominated and then elected governor, a guy by the name of Walter Edge. And he was very accommodating to both bosses, which is why they would rather have him than Whitpen, who was a reformer, and Colgate, who was also a reformer, but a Republican reformer. So they basically joined forces to bring this about. And that's where the term one day Republicans come from. So Haig basically had a bunch of Democrats vote in the Republican primary to take it away from this guy Colgate and give it to Walter Edge. And he did this repeatedly <laughs> throughout um, the next 15 or so years, including another famous incident in 1937, where again, he tied up with Nucky Johnson to defeat the Republican in favor of his guy, A. Harry Moore. So in 1937, A. Harry Moore, who had already served two terms as governor, but at that time he couldn't serve consecutive terms, so there were intermissions between his tenures. So the Democratic Party wanted to have um, a guy named, let me see if I got it right, Lester Klee was actually Republican, but they colluded to vote more into office. And the Republicans, except for Nucky Johnson, squealed like crazy. And this launched a whole range of um, serious attempts to bring Haig down. And a lot of the... We're gonna just break for commercial. We'll be right back with Stick at Night. Hudson TMA reminds you that a bicycle is considered a vehicle. When you ride a bike, you must obey the rules of the road. Ride single file in the same direction as traffic. Obey traffic signs and signals. Signal your turns and look behind you before you turn. And always stay alert. Voting by mail has never been easier. Just follow these steps to ensure your vote will be counted. Open your envelope. You will find your certificate, return envelope, and official ballot. When casting your ballot, use only a pencil, black, or blue ink, not red. Completely fill in the oval to the right of each selection. When writing in, do not repeat a name printed on the ballot. If torn or damaged, your vote will not be counted. Fold your ballot and place it in the pocket of the certificate before sealing it with the adhesive strip. Do not detach the strip and paper from the certificate. Fill out the required information on the certificate and don't forget to sign. If you are not mailing or delivering your ballot in person, make sure both you and the bearer of the ballot sign your name and address on the certificate and return envelope. After that, just place it in the mailbox and your vote will be counted. For more information, you can visit our website at www.hudsoncountyclerk.org or www.hudsoncountynj.org.
Hudson TMA reminds you that a bicycle is considered a vehicle. When you ride a bike, you must obey the rules of the road. Ride single file in the same direction as traffic. Obey traffic signs and signals. Signal your turns and look behind you before you turn. And always stay alert. Welcome back to Stick at Night. I'm Commissioner Anthony L. Romano. Let's continue with Joe Murray about the interesting perspective on Jersey City political history during the egg times. Go ahead, Joe. Well, Tony, maybe it would be helpful for those who often hear the term machine politics to actually know why it's used and what it means. So, as you can imagine, it suggests a manufactured outcome, an engineered result not always done legitimately or legally, but basically it was always about ensuring that the party in power stayed in power and there was no opportunity for defeat. So Haig wrote the book on this and he did it by basically organizing and having absolute efficiency in the way that the vote was canvassed and the way the vote was gotten out. So they not only manufactured votes, they manufactured voters. They ensured that everybody who was eligible to vote was registered and voted. And to a, an astonishing degree of efficiency. For example, um, I mean, this is the way they organized the structure. So he didn't call it a machine, he called it the organization. And it was all fueled by votes for favors and support. So all of his constituents were taken care of down to the neighborhood and block level. Everybody was known on a first name basis. And through all of that, Haig was able to get 92% of eligible voters registered and 85 or greater percent of voters actually voting. And if you didn't vote, they would have gotten you to the poll, dragged you out of the bar and taken you to the voting booth and you would have voted. So the Democratic Party could learn quite a lot <laughs> about how to defeat what I think is becoming a Republican national machine by emulating some of the practices of, of Haig's machine. Well, it's interesting, uh, my grandfather and my grandmothers in downtown Jersey City and downtown Hoboken adored Haig and McFeely. Now, they didn't even speak English. They said he kept the right. streets clean, he knocked on a door, what could we do? Now, that's amazing and interesting because here's the Irish machine with these Italian right. immigrants that don't speak English. But you could never say a bare word. My grandmother in a broken English, oh, hey, the good man, good man. So you got, uh, and McFeely on the other side with my great aunt who was a bootlegger. And really? uh, it, it's interesting. Well, the funny thing is, that's ultimately what brought both McFeely and Haig down was the, the insufficient enfranchisement of the ethnic communities, particularly the Italians who had surpassed the Irish by 1950, 1940 even, the Italians were in Jersey City, were the dominant uh, ethnic group. And they demanded recognition both politically and economically, especially at the waterfront, which is where Haig derived a huge amount of his financial resources. Isn't that true about Ganjemi? They dug up something when he became A to get rid of him? <laughs> that was actually after Haig. That was Kenny who did that. But um, Ganjemi was the first Italian mayor of Jersey City. That's right, 1961. And then they deported him, right? <laughs> he wasn't a citizen. It turns out that he was not a citizen, yeah. I actually went to school. His grandson went to prep with us. He was two years behind us. We were very good friends. But we couldn't talk about, we couldn't talk about politics, though. <laughs> no, I can see that. So go ahead, yeah. continue, Joe. Where you were going with the machine. With the disenfranchisement well, so of the uh, different ethnic groups. What brought about the end of the Hague era were, it's a couple of things, but the biggest factor was probably that Hague never deviated from his business model of having core Irish candidates. So he retired from the mayoralty in 47 to be county Democratic boss, and he put his nephew in charge. So his nephew, a guy by the name of Frank Hague Eggers, was mayor from 47 to 49. And in 49, he was soundly defeated 
by John Kenny and my grandfather and the other 49ers because they ethnically diversified the ticket. They put on Italians, they put on Polish, Polish yeah. which had never done before, right? So those were the two dominant ethnic groupings at the time. And they had no direct political power until Kenny. So Kenny opened the Pandora's, Pandora's box of ethnic politics in Hudson County, breaking the Irish monopoly. Wow. So, and as you, what your grandfather now, he fades out after um, uh, Kenny goes to jail with the famous trial with the Jersey City, what was it, Jersey City 7? Actually, my grandfather faded out much sooner. He ran with Kenny in 49, and then he quickly broke with Kenny in 1950, <laughs> um, being, being the maverick politician that he was, because Kenny turned out to be less competent than Haig, but more corrupt, if you can imagine. And Kenny got himself into serious trouble by breaking open the waterfront. Remember, Jersey City and the Port of New York was the busiest port in the world at that time. But Jersey City was languishing in terms of modernizing and mechanizing the port. Right. But the there was still enormous. Like Hoboken. Right. Hoboken, very on the waterfront, took place in Hoboken, right? The movie. Well, they both declined, both cities at the same time. As they rose, they declined, and now they ro rose again for different reasons. Yes. Through the auspices of the Port Authority, which at that time was considered a threat to machine interests, right? So yes. um, to get, my grandfather actually died in office as a commissioner. Uh, wow. Be because he had loggerheads with Kenny. Uh, and then the torch passed to my father, who really didn't want to be a politician. You know, he was a lawyer, he was a practicing lawyer in New York, he, very gifted guy, veteran, World War II hero and so forth. He sort of carried the torch after my grandfather was persecuted by Hay, uh, by Kenny, excuse me. And then he ran for senator and won. He was Hudson County senator from 54 to 58. And then in 57, he launched what was called the Victory Movement with Gan Jemmy. And everybody won but Ganjemi. <laughs> uh, so you had Kenny displaced, still a commission system. So Kenny lost City Hall in 57 only once. And my, grand, my father was the top vote getter and was wow. supposed to be mayor. Yeah, he was supposed to be mayor. But under the commission system, the commissioners themselves selected who was to be mayor. Uh, and Ganjemi was so pissed at losing that he didn't want my father to be mayor. So he... He voted for a non-Irishman. He wanted Wachowski over my father to become the mayor, who became mayor in 57. Not many people remember Charlie Wachowski, but he was the first non-Irish mayor in 50 years, right? 40 years. Wow, that's amazing. Well, so, Joe, sum it up because we're going to come into the end of the show. Sure. It's so interesting. We could do a whole nother show on it. So give us your last remarks or any requests of our audience. Sure. Well, I mean, it's a lot to take in. There's a lot out there, as you might be able to judge. I've been digging deeply and trying to get as much of this stuff out there as possible. There are three documentaries that are available online and through the New Jersey Room that have literally rare and vintage stuff that nobody else has in terms of footage, interviews, photographs, etc. So it's worth checking out if you really enjoy this stuff. My high school classmate, my dear friend, and thank you for your support during my uh, issues. Good to talk of to course. you, Joe Murray. God bless everybody out there. Thank you from Stick at Night, your Commissioner, Anthony L. Romano. Thank you.